so many of you here tonight for our first speaker series lecture, the fall 2014 semester. Thank you all for coming. So tonight our speaker is Dr. Mark Carew. Carew how do I, <laughs> which do I say, Mark? Dr. K, Dr. K works, Dr. yeah. K. Um, Carew Caro is more or less Caro. Okay. more or less correct, though if you ask my mom, it's Carew. <laughs> so, see, see, my parents have been married for almost 50 years and they can't figure it out, so <laughs> who else is going to? Mark is UW Schwinn's Associate Professor of History. He holds a Bachelor of Arts and a Master of Arts from Marquette University and a PhD from Florida State University. Uh, Dr. K joined the UW Colleges in 2001 and he came to join us here at UW Schwinn in 2008. Tonight, uh, Mark will be discussing uh, the Battle of Marne. Do I say Marne? That is correct. Marne. Okay. And the content for his lecture tonight comes from uh, the current book, Germany's Defeat in the First World War, The Lost Battles and Reckless Gambles That Brought Down the Second Reich, which goes to press this fall and will be available next year. So mm -hmm. please welcome Dr. K and please <laughs> join us for all the rest of these lectures throughout this semester. And please check our website. We also have a new series this year for our 50th anniversary. It's the 50th anniversary lecture series. And those start September 23rd with a history of the UW colleges. And they'll be held Tuesday and Thursday nights in the same room. Okay? Thank you. Take it away. Welcome, everybody. I'm glad to see a nice big turnout. Um, for those of you who may not know, this is exactly the 100th anniversary of the last day of the Battle of the Marne. It started on September 5th of 1914. It ended on September 9th of 1914. And it was, as one, one scholar of the war has said, the decisive battle of not only this war, but really the entire 20th century. And it's the battle that determined, in many ways, who was going to win and who was going to lose the First World War. I'll be explaining why that is. We'll talk a little bit about the the aftermath of the battle. Um, I will field any questions you have once we've gone about 45 minutes or so. But we need to start by talking about why the war actually breaks out. So I've got a couple people here I can put on the spot because they're in my World War I course. <laughs> so Elijah and Tobin, help me out here. Why does this war break out? <laughs> the immediate spark, the immediate cause is what? Elijah? Assassination of All right, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the throne of Austria-Hungary. He is shot and killed in the city of Sarajevo in Bosnia on June 28, 1914, by a Bosnian Serb named Gavrilo Princip. If you've been paying much attention to the, the news and, and the 100th, anniversary of, of the outbreak of the war. You've probably seen Princip's picture. You've probably heard some about, something about this. Franz Ferdinand is killed on the 28th. War breaks out between Austria and Serbia one month later, on the 28th of July. The Austrian reaction to the outbreak of war, I'm sorry, to the, to the assassination, was to go to war with Serbia in an attempt to destroy Serbian power. Serbia was seen, let me pull up another map here, was seen as a, I shouldn't do this, this computer is so slow. <laughs> All right, maybe I won't. Um, Serbia was seen by the Austro-Hungarians as a very serious threat because the Austrians had a large number of minorities contained within their monarchy, many of whom were Serbian, and saw Serbia as a, a rallying a rallying point, a, the country that they wanted to belong to. So the Austrians made the decision that they had to destroy Serbia. But this triggered a much larger conflict because of a series of existing alliances between the various European powers. Some of you may be familiar with this. Again, Elijah and Tobin, you should be. Uh, Serbia is supported by Russia for reasons of ethnic and national solidarity. The Serbians were Slavic speakers, so were the Russians. The Russian government was affected by pan-Slavism, an idea 
that they were, in essence, the protectors of the other Slavic races of, in particular, southeastern Europe. So if Austria is going to go to war with Serbia, Russia is likely going to back up Serbia to protect the sort of Slavic little brothers of the Balkans. That means Austria needs support. They have their own support in Germany. Germany is allied to Austria-Hungary, and the Germans agree in the crisis of July 1914 that they will support Austria. If Austria wants to go to war with Serbia, and this means war with Russia, Germany will face war with Russia. And that in turn will trigger an alliance between Russia and France, which means Germany will be at war with France. Likely Great Britain will become involved because they have an agreement, though not a strict alliance, with both Russia and France. So this is how this small assassination, in the Reader's Digest version, <laughs> ends up resulting in a massive European war. Austria ends up going to war with Serbia. The Russian response is to mobilize their army and prepare to go to war with Austria. That requires Germany to mobilize theirs. How this all gets us to the Marne has to do with the German battle plan, which is what this map shows. The plan was for a very, very long time called the Schlieffen Plan. Uh, it came from a study that was done by a head of the German general staff named Alfred von Schlieffen, which was written up in 1905. There's a huge debate now in the scholarship over whether or not this was actually meant to be a war plan or whether it was just some musings by Schlieffen in 1905. Whether or not it was intended to be a war plan, it became one. Schlieffen's successor, who came to control the army in 1906, adopted it. His name was Helmut von Moltke, so the plan is now referred to as the Schlieffen-Moltke plan. And it was an attempt to deal with a serious problem that the Germans and the Austro-Hungarians faced. If they're going to go to war with an alliance of France and Russia, they have a serious numerical problem. And this chart shows it. The Russian population for men of military age is better than 21 million. You add into that 10 million from France, you're looking at 31 million compared to a total population for men of military age for what becomes known as the Central Powers of about 16 million. You're outnumbered by better than 2 to 1. So how do you deal with that? And the German answer was to make use of their far more advanced national infrastructure. They have far more railways than the Russians do. The Russians, in 1914, were in the process of building a whole series of new rail lines. But in July of 1914, they only had three rail lines that ran through Russian Poland, which is the area where the, any war is likely to be fought. What that meant was it would take a long time for the Russians to call up their army. I have another chart for you. Zoom out here a little bit. This one shows the peacetime numbers, the standing armies for the major powers that are involved here in July of 1914, and then their fully mobilized armies. So Russia, as you can see, has a standing army of 1.3 million men, along with France's 900,000, compared to Germany's roughly 900,000. Mobilization, as this question popped up today in class, involved bringing the reserves out to the front and committing them to battle. So the Russian army is going to expand enormously. So are the French and the Germans. This process involves sending letters to your reservists, telling them where they have to report to, getting them to report to the depots, getting their weapons, getting their uniforms, putting them on trains, and shipping them out to their staging areas. The more railroads you have, obviously the faster this goes. Germany is covered in railroads by 1914. So the German plan is based on the notion that they can get their men 
about 4 million or so, to where they need to be to fight France long before Russia can mobilize their army and really be effective. If they can't do that, they face a situation of a long, drawn-out war where they're badly outnumbered. And you notice, those numbers don't include who? Great Britain. You add the British numbers in, and those become that much worse for the Germans and the Austrians. So here's the plan. We have to, if you're German, knock the French out of the war as quickly as possible. Defeat them before the Russian army can fully mobilize. The German thinking was we have six weeks with which to do this. In reality, they only had about four. The Russians mobilized a lot faster than the Germans expected. The frontier between Germany and France runs through here. It was extremely heavily fortified. It was the most heavily fortified frontier in the world. To send your army, which is roughly equal to that of the French, battering against the French fortress lines, you're not going to get anywhere. You're going to be basically bogged down in siege warfare. The French army doesn't have to fight you. They can fall back behind their forts and let you batter yourself against the forts while the Russian army mobilizes out in the east and then steamrolls its way into Germany. So what do you have to do? Well, the answer is here. The Germans decide, we need to send our army this way. I do not have a working pointer in here, or do I? Eh, sometimes. All right. So the German army is split. There's a small portion placed down here in the provinces of Alsace and Lorraine, basically to, to tie down some French troops. There's a, some forces that would be all the way out here, if we had a bigger map, facing the Russians. Not very many of them. 75% of the German army is coming this way. It is sweeping through Belgium, driving towards Paris, with the idea that it's going to surround the French army, encircle it, and completely destroy it, leaving France helpless and winning the war in the West for Germany in six weeks. What this means, however, in the context of July 1914, is that as soon as the Russians start mobilizing their army, the Germans have to do the same thing. So Austria-Hungary declares war on Serbia on July 28th. Two days later, the Russians mobilize their army to get ready to possibly go to war against Austria-Hungary. The Germans send an ultimatum quickly to Russia on the next day, July 31st, in essence ordering the Russians to stop mobilizing or they will face war with Germany. When Russia refuses, Germany declares war on Russia on August 1st. And their army promptly moves west. They send an ultimatum to France on the next day, turn over to Germany all of these border fortifications, or we will declare war on you. Shockingly, the French said no. So Germany declared war on France on August 3rd, and then promptly invaded Belgium on the next day. The Belgians had been neutral. They really had hoped to stay out of anything like this. The Germans gave them a choice, too. They gave them an ultimatum. Don't resist, and when the war is over, we'll make sure you get all of your territory back the way it was. And the Belgians also said no, and decided to fight. What results are a series of initial campaigns that are known as the Battles of the Frontiers. These began in early August. Before I go any further, are there any questions? If anything pops up, feel free to you know, throw a hand up. The purple, what you see are those are forts, French forts. Are you talking about these or those? The bluish purple. Um, these are all French. They're, some are forts, Verdun, Toul, um, Belfort, all of those have forts. There are forts around Paris. But they're also concentrations of French armies. There are five French armies running from the first army, as you can see here, first, second, third, fourth, and fifth, on up the line. 
the British do join the war, and they send their small professional army to the, well, there goes my pointer, um, to the northern end of the line. And then you have the German armies, numbered one through seven on the other side, with basically five of them designed to come through Belgium. Other questions? All right. The first German objective, which takes longer than they had anticipated, is to seize the Belgian town of Liège. They assault that on August 4th. This entire plan is highly regimented and scripted. The, it is planned out literally down to the last detail. Everything has to be done within this six-week window. And it's thrown off immediately. The idea was that Liège would have, to be, would have to be taken within two days. The assault on Liège begins on the 4th. Liège surrenders on August 16th. Significantly more than two days. Um, and as a result, the plan is, is really thrown off. But the Germans generally do very well in August of 1914 in all of these battles along the frontiers. Their plan is to come through Belgium. The French plan, as you can see here, is to invade Germany. And this kind of plays into the hands of, of the German plan. French troops are moving out of position. What you have are five German armies basically marching against the Belgians, the British, and one French army. And the Belgians basically abandon the field. Uh, the Belgian army is not well equipped. It is small, um, it has antiquated weapons, and the Belgian army very quickly abandons most of Belgium and retreats right off the map to the port of Antwerp um, to try and hold one port. So the Germans pretty quickly are able to march into Belgium. They first clash with French troops on August 15th. That is up around Namur, right through here. They drive the French back. Five days later, they run into British forces at Mons, and they drive the British back. The Germans had an extremely well-equipped, very well-trained army. Um, their military doctrine was also superior to that of their opponents. What they practiced was a, a sort of um, a, I don't want to say t um, decentralized military command, but it's close to that. The overall plan was broken down, let me try to explain it this way, so that each army commander is given their own mission. How they're going to accomplish that mission is entirely up to them. They are given the general mission and you have to accomplish that. Then Kluck, commander of the first army, tells each of his corps commanders, here's your objective. How you accomplish that objective is up to you. And this goes down the line to divisions, all the way down to squads so that the, the, the lowest ranking officers are being told, you do what you need to do on the battlefield to make this overall plan happen. Their opponents, the Russians, the French as well, even the British, were far more top down. If you, if, if you had to make a, a critical decision on the British side at Mons, you had to report up the line. To, the, to your higher officer, who would report up to his higher officer to decide what needed to be done. So you have one side that's far more flexible, can make more decisions on the fly, and the other that is somewhat paralyzed by going up and down the chain of command. Yes? How did the Brits get there so fast? Oh, excellent question. Britain declared war on August 4th, and plans had been laid out years in advance for exactly what was going to happen in the event of a, a war between Germany and France. The British and French commanders had been working on joint mobilization plans since basically 19, 1908, 1909. So as soon as Britain was at war, the British Expeditionary Forces put on ships and sailed over to France. And it goes immediately to where it has all along been intended to go. 
This is despite the fact they didn't have a formal alliance. The reason for, for there not being a formal alliance was that the British Prime Minister, I'm sorry, Foreign Minister, Edward Gray, as I mentioned today in class, could have plausible deniability. There are a lot of people in the British government who don't like this idea of, well, we're going to go to war to help France against Germany. And any time he was asked, well, do we, are we obligated to go aid France? He could always say, well, no, we have freedom of, of action. We're not obligated to do anything. Because the letter of the treaty did not require them to do anything. The spirit of the treaty, on the other hand, is very clear, and all the military planning that's done is also very clear. But Gray could always tell his more pacifist colleagues in the cabinet, no, we, we have total freedom of action in the event of a war. But they're ready, and when war comes, the BEF goes exactly to where it needs to be. Well, yes? Right, yes. This is not a mobilized army either. That's a good point. Because the British had a small professional army, just over 100,000 men. And it's based in England. It's, it's ready to go um, in the event that something like this happens. So it's relatively easy to get them to where they need to be. Well, this war was no surprise. Not really. No, no, not at all. Uh, most, most every one of these major powers knew that war was likely coming. There had been a lot of crises in the years before the war, basically ever since 1904. There had been crises over Morocco twice. There had been major crises in the Balkans that almost led to war. And there was a, a Cold War atmosphere where both sides expected war. Both sides really wanted war. Um, by 1914, there was a general sense that we need to have a war. We need to fight this. We need to have it over with. We need to kind of clear the air. And the best way to do that is to fight this war. Nobody thought they were going to get the war they got. They all thought this would be a fairly short conflict. They were looking at something like the Franco-Prussian War, which was fought in 1870 and 1871, where a couple of battles were fought that basically decided the war. Had they paid more attention to something like the U.S. Civil War, they would have had a better idea as to what they were in for. But they weren't looking at that example. They were looking at 1866, when Germany beat Prussia in six weeks, and 1870, when the French army was basically beaten immediately, and the war simply dragged on for another nine months. Good question. Yeah, Jerry. At this stage of the, the war, you're talking about fully mobilization, so it's going to be cavalry charges, limited mobility, Yes, yes. No trenches have been dug. The expectation is that we're going to fight a massive battle. German army is going to surround the French army, it's going to destroy it, and then we can shift all of our troops east for a longer, more drawn-out war against the Russians. And the French expectation is the same. We're going to march into Germany, we're going to smash the German army, and then we're going to win the war. So we're not, there, are, there are no trenches that are dug until after the Battle of the Marne. That's part of the significance of the battle. Other questions? Yeah. You comment on the professional German army, presumably Prussian mostly? Mostly, but not all. Um, Germany was a federal state. It was dominated by Prussia, but Bavaria had its own army. Baden had its own army. Württemberg had its own army. They worked basically under Prussian leadership and Prussian command, but they did have their own military establishments, their own officers, they kept their own records, they had their own general staffs, which is great for historians because all the Prussian military records were bombed to ruins in 1945, and the Bavarian ones survived because Munich didn't get bombed as bad. So we actually, that's where most of our information ends up coming from, is from Bavarian and Badenese records. Other questions? So in these initial battles, this basically runs from the 4th down to the 30th of August. And the Germans win a series of victories. They turn back the French attacks here in the south. There are some brief moments in the middle of August where the French do manage to occupy small towns like Mulhouse. 
but then the Germans counterattack and drive them back out. In these areas, the French are attacking into difficult terrain. The Germans are able to drive them back. There's heavy fighting in the Ardennes Forest, which, you, which name you probably know if you are a World War II buff for things like the Battle of the Bulge. Um, but here in Belgium, the Germans basically sweep the British and French out of their way. Start with the Ardennes Forest on That would be right through here. What very quickly develops is a critical situation for both sides. And this is the situation for, for the Battle of the Marne. The lines stagnate here along the frontiers. But as you can see, German forces have pushed all the way through Belgium, which is up all the way here, and have driven all the way down near to Paris by early September. There are German forces by the 5th of September within 60 kilometers of Paris. They've made some changes to their plans. According to the original Schlieffen plan, they were supposed to sweep around Paris. By September, they don't have the manpower to do that. Both sides suffer severe losses in the Battle of the Frontiers, losing over a quarter of a million men in really bloody fighting. We're used to thinking of trenches in this war. The bloodiest fighting was August and September of 1914. More men are, do more men are killed in those two months than in any other two-month span of the entire war because they don't have trench protection. And military tactics have not caught up to modern weaponry. So you have rapid-firing heavy artillery, you have machine guns, you have repeating rifles, and you have military tactics that essentially involve not marching any longer across open fields, but running across open fields to try and get close enough to the enemy, which leads to massive casualties. The French and British armies get pushed back, and by the 5th of September, it looks as if the Germans are going to succeed. The Marne River runs right through here, and the Germans have pushed the French and the British back to this line. However, what has also happened is that the Germans have outrun their supply lines. German soldiers have been marching and fighting extensively for the better part of an entire month. Their men are weary. They are low on ammunition. They are low on food. And the French are falling back on their supply lines, which gives them an extra advantage. The French are also falling back on Paris, which is, has a series of fortresses built around it and is also a center for French reinforcements. For new men who are in the process of being mobilized, many of them are being shipped into Paris. What all of that means is that the war is, in these first days of September, kind of on a knife's edge. It can go either way. The Germans are worn out. Um, the French are getting a bit of a second wind. And if I could pull these things off of here, I would. But what I want you to look at is not these blue arrows, but instead this, this red line and these red lines. All the red lines are German armies. The blue lines are French armies. What do we have? It's a great big gap that has opened up between most of the German army and this one, the German first army. The reason for the gap is that on the 4th of September, the 3rd and the 4th, the French put together a, a very hastily assembled new army in Paris and rushed it to the front lines, and it began attacking the German First Army basically on September 4th. 
That forced the German First Army to turn from this area to its west, to face this new threat. And the German commander, Alexander von Kluck, pulled forces from here to his other flank to try and destroy this new French army. And he opened up this gap in the process. The German overall commander, Moltke, is all the way back here in Luxembourg. And kind of out of the loop in, in terms of what's going on. He's getting reports, but not all the German units have radios. And therefore, the reports that he's getting are somewhat sketchy. He's not fully aware of what's going on. The French commander, Joff, on the other hand, is everywhere. He is a whirlwind of activity in late August and early September of 1914. He's traveling from every one of his armies. He's putting together another new army here. He is trying to work with a very, very reluctant British commander who has convinced the war is lost and wants to march to the channel and get out and trying to pull all of these things together. And it's Joff who realizes the existence of this gap. And the Battle of the Marne begins on September 5th when the French and the British start driving into that gap. The problem, from a German perspective, what happens if they get through? Hmm? They're going to cut off at least this German army, and they're going to threaten all of these others. What takes place over the course of the five days of this battle are a series of arguments between German commanders and a series of fairly slow attacks by the British and the French Fifth Army, slowly moving into this gap. They see the gap, they know it's there, but neither one of them really believes that it's not a German trap, that the Germans aren't just trying to lure them in so that they can then slap around behind the French and British and cut them off and destroy them. The commander of the German First Army, von Kluck, the commander of the German Second Army, von Bülow, the two men do not cooperate, they do not like each other, and they are both greedy for glory. This is also a problem because you're in a situation here in early September where you need to cooperate with one another and neither one of them has any interest in doing so. I guess I didn't bring that. All right. on, the on the fifth, the British and French attacks begin. They're very cautious. They continue on the sixth. And by the evening of the 6th, von Bülow is terribly concerned about this gap and this emerging allied force that is marching through it. He entreats von Kluck to move his forces to the east to close the gap. Von Kluck refuses to do so. He is convinced that if he can destroy the French army in front of him, the road to Paris is open, he can take Paris, and he will be the man who wins the war. So he holds his ground. There are no other reinforcements that the Germans can call on. There's a couple of reasons why that is the case. One, as I mentioned earlier tonight, the Russians mobilized in four weeks, not six. There's already been a major battle on the Eastern Front, and Moltke, basically panicking, decided to shift men who were meant for this front out east. So there are several, about 100,000 or so German men who are going east, who get there too late to take part in any battle in the east, and would have made a huge difference here in the west. A second is because of the Belgians. Even though they didn't fight, they played a big role at the Marne. They ran back to Antwerp. Some German troops had to follow them. Had to follow them and keep an eye on them and make sure they didn't come marching out of Antwerp behind the German lines. 
That weakened the Germans further. Some troops had to be shifted to the north. They don't really accomplish much at Antwerp, and they could have played a big role here as well. Third factor is that here, on this side of the front, when the French launched their attacks under their own war plan, Moltke shifted some troops from the northern part of the line to the southern part of the line. He's stronger here than he needs to be, and he's weaker there than he needs to be. So there are no reserves available at this point. Things get worse on the 7th. But it's still, it's, it's reading this and, and researching it and looking at the maps, it's like this slow motion crisis that's taking place. Because you've got the British who are very, very timidly kind of pushing their way through, and the French following them. There's really nobody in front of them. And they could have driven all the way through to Chateau Terry, to Epinal, but they're really being very, very cautious and careful. And then you have Clock, who is adamant that he is going to defeat the French Sixth Army. He completely ignores this. He is utterly unconcerned with the gap, and Bulow cares about nothing but the gap. These armies, which probably should have been able to put more pressure on the French here and force the French to pull forces from the West, do nothing. So there's some paralysis, there's some panic. By the 8th, things are at a real crisis point in multiple areas. Von Kluck is destroying the French 6th Army. He is battering it to pieces, and he may very well open the road to Paris. But at the same time, he's on the brink of being completely cut off. The whole thing comes to a head on the 8th and the 9th. On the 8th, Moltke decides he needs to get more information on what is going on here. He's not getting enough reports, he's not clear, and he decides to send an attaché to all of the German armies along the entire line and find out what exactly is going on. The man's name is Colonel Richard Hench. The Ger for the German army, he became one of the great villains of the war. He was blamed for what happens at the Marne. His job was to travel along the lines and find out what's happening. He starts here in the south, discovers that with the 6th and 7th armies, everything is basically fine. They've pushed the French back. Things are stable. They can't really make any headway, but they're not supposed to. Their, their job in the war plan is simply to hold their ground. He moves along to the 5th and the 4th and the 3rd, and again, things are, are stable, they've made inroads, there's still, there's some fighting going on, but it's not really heavy fighting. They're kind of waiting for the first and second armies, which were designed to be the hammer in this offensive, to finish their job. When he arrives at second army headquarters late on the 8th, he encounters an absolutely panicked Bulow who is blaming Kluck for the fact that this entire war plan is about to go up in smoke, Germany is about to lose the war because the British and the French are coming through this gap and he can't do anything about it. They must retreat, is the refrain that Hench hears from Bulow. If we do not fall back and retreat, we risk total defeat. You have to convince Kluck to pull back and retreat. So on the 9th, Hench makes his way to the First Army, where he encounters a completely different atmosphere. Kluck and his men are absolutely confident that immediate total victory is right around the corner, but Hench gives orders to Kluck that he will have to retreat. Bulow begins retreating even without Kluck doing so. He starts pulling back his lines, which is what you can see happening here, opening the gap even further. Hench gives orders that Kluck will have to abandon his offensive, and Kluck reluctantly does so. The question for a lot of German officers in the aftermath was, did Hench exceed his authority? Could he actually do this? Um, Moltke never really said. Moltke suffers a nervous breakdown in these critical days, and he dies while the war is going on. 
and he had never written or said anything clearly one way or the other, how much authority he gave Hench. Which leads one to the conclusion that he either did give Hench that authority and didn't want to take the blame for himself, or he didn't and was content to let Hench kind of hang out there anyway. Jerry? In that gap, did you split the indecision? Isn't there any air recon going on? Very little. Very, very little. This is really early in the war. And airplanes are being used, but in a, in a very, again, as I say, limited way. Neither side has many. So you do have some aerial reconnaissance that's taking place, but you're not getting a very good picture, uh, even from, from the aerial recon. You don't have any means in 1914 of taking aerial photographs. So what they're using to report back to the ground literally are, pa are carrier pigeons. And you're, yeah, you've got an observer in the back of the plane who's writing out a note and sticking it on the leg of a pigeon and throwing the pigeon out of the plane. And the pigeon flies back down with the message. Yeah, that was my reaction too when I first found that. I was going through... No real-time intelligence. Yes. I was going through documents, doing my dissertation research many, many years ago, and I kept running into the German word for pigeon. And I'm going, this can't mean what it, what, I mean, I, I know I'm not a native German speaker, but I can't be making this big of a mistake translating. And eventually I got confirmation from native, some native German speakers that I knew, yeah, they're, they're putting messages on passenger pigeons and, and using them to send messages back and forth. Um, the early days of this war, there are lots of things like that. Um, students get, have great fun with the stories of guys firing pistols at each other while they're trying to fly airplanes and bombing runs that are basically a guy <laughs> leaning out dropping a hand grenade. So there's, there's all kinds of stuff like that happening in the early stages of the war. The, the, the short answer, Jerry, is that no. They just don't have the, the, the recon information. Cavalry is used to, a, to an extent, but part of the issue, to be blunt, really has to do with the British commander. And French, the, that's the name of the British commander, uh, which just, just to create more confusion when you're trying to study this as an undergrad, um, the, the British commander, John French, was convinced after Mons and after a series of initial battles with the Germans that the British could not stand up to the German army and that any attack on the Germans was completely pointless. We're going to get turned back. We, we need to get out of here. You know, we, France can't be helped. We're going to lose our whole British army here in France. And his reluctance is part of why the British move so slowly. And they've got the best opportunity to really push into the gap because the French fifth is facing the German second. There's really nobody in front of the BEF. There's a few German cavalry screens, and that's it. A couple hundred German soldiers. And they're, they're enough to slow down several divisions of British troops. Wasn't this, this uh, right now shows that mainly horsepower was running the army, right? Oh, yes, absolutely. Indeed. If you mean in terms of transportation? Yeah. Yes. But in other words, getting enough pay to keep horses. Big so difference. Horses. Yep. And that's, yeah, that's a huge problem for the Germans all the way through the war. Um, they, they have insufficient livestock for farming back home and running the army. So they have to kind of balance agriculture versus fighting, and this is something they never really can manage. So that, that's an issue all the way through. Here it's critical because if you're going to move anything, it's going to be moved pretty slowly. For when, when Cluck, for example, starts moving his troops out of the gap and sending them north, it takes two days for them to get back in position. So he's moving them on the third, they're creating the gap, and they're not over here able to do anything until the fifth. So you've got, again, this kind of this slow motion process taking place. The, uh, I know they're dependent on horsepower to move the artillery and stuff like that, but I, I seem to remember with the, when later on in the Battle of the Somme and stuff, they were, the Brits especially were saying, now when we make this breakthrough, 
we're going to send the cavalry. Oh, yeah. There. Oh, yeah. And they're training the horses so they can jump the trenches. Yes. And uh, so it's still... Uh, it's very much an old school style of warfare until really 1916. And that's when you start getting some of the newer technology coming into play. Until that point, it's the kind of warfare that Civil War veterans would have recognized. You know, it, it, aside from newer artillery and better machine guns and rifles, a lot of what's happening would have been very familiar. With Hensch's orders, what, what what happens is the German army essentially gives up this advance. And Hensch's orders signal defeat for the Germans at the Marne River. Hensch orders Kluck to retreat. Kluck reluctantly agrees. And what ensues is a massive German withdrawal to a line roughly running through here. The French pursue, but they can't break the German army. And by the end of September, everyone basically runs out of steam. And the fighting temporarily comes to a halt out of sheer exhaustion on both sides. The battle, the key battle, is this one that happens here between the 5th and the 9th, this Battle of the Marne. And victory here means, for the British and French, that the German war plan, their recipe for victory, has failed. The Schlieffen and Moltke plan fails, and now Germany will face a long, drawn-out war. The Germans will try in late, later in 1914 to kind of restart the offensive in, in the West by looping around the British and French, trying to come around the British and French flanks, moving to the north. The British and French will respond by meeting them, and they will do the same thing again and again and again until they get to the English Channel. Without being able to turn anybody's flank, it's at that point, late in October, that we start getting trenches being dug. And the war starts turning into the war that we're used to if you've seen documentaries on World War I. Elijah? Absolutely. Whether or not they would have won the war is a really open question. But a quicker movement through here absolutely could have cut off Kluck's first army. This could have been an even bigger victory. As it was, it was a huge strategic victory for the French and British. It was not seen as a great victory, though, because it didn't win the war immediately. But if we take a look at the consequences, which is the next thing I want to talk about here, it, you could make the argument that it basically decided the outcome of the war. And this is the argument that Holger Herwig, the historian I referenced earlier, makes. He wrote an ar article many years ago arguing that this was the decisive battle of the entire war. Because once this was over, those numbers that I showed you come into play. And let me put up the ones once we include Great Britain. There we go. Men of military age. Central powers, 16 million. France and Russia, 32. Great Britain, almost 11. That doesn't fully include all of their potential men out of the British Empire. This is just men from Great Britain, South Africa, Australia, Canada, the White Dominions. If you start drafting African soldiers into the British Army, now you're talking 20 to 30 million men. The French do that, the British don't. 41 million to 15. In a long drawn out war, this is critical. 
And here you have, I could probably have ended the book right here. And here's, here's the reason why Germany loses the war. It's in black and white. Um, they probably wouldn't pay me much for 10 pages. So I, I figured I had to add something. Um, but what that means is something really extraordinary is going to have to happen if you're going to win this war is the Germans and the Austrians. With the failure at the Marne, Germany is, in effect, surrounded. They're surrounded by Russian soldiers in the east, French and British soldiers in the west. The Italians eventually join the war against them, so they're surrounded on, on the south. They have to fight the Serbians in the southeast. The British put a naval blockade in place to cut Germany off from all contact with the outside world. And as the years go on, and the Germans lose manpower, and they lose livestock, the food supply declines, the German people began to starve, the army gets weaker and weaker. You look at the later battles, and it's hard to find a place where you could look and say, yeah, if they won this, they could win the war. They, they launch a battle at Verdun in 1916, thinking, you know, we can break the French army and we can win the war. But looking at it objectively, if you don't look at it through the lens of the German commanders who planned it, who obviously are going to be optimistic about it, it's hard to see how a blood lily like that is going to help you. The, the numbers are so badly against you that the economic numbers are as bad as the manpower numbers. So once they lose the Marne, militarily, there's very little the German army can do to win this war. If they're going to win it, the, there really are only two options. One is to simply try and hang on so long that their enemies will suffer so many casualties, they will eventually decide it's not worth continuing the war, we'll let the Germans have a, a good Germanic peace treaty. Or they can do what they eventually try in 1917 and gamble on winning the war at sea by strangling Great Britain with a submarine campaign. That turns into a total disaster because it brings the United States into the war. And then those numbers get even uglier. Um, this is the moment where the Germans, I would argue, lose the First World War. The war begins June, on, on August 1st, and it's basically over in terms of who's going to win it by September 9th. It's not over in terms of all the men who are going to die, about 12 million die over the course of the next four years. But the war had essentially been determined in some ways. You could make the argument that all those planners who said, we're going to fight one big decisive war, and the battle, one big battle, and the war is going to be over, were right. But the Germans don't want to admit it. Yes? Well, what's the uh, turmoil turning the French war there? If the Germans would have played their cards correctly, we started the war U.S. boats, which brought the U.S. in. Without the U.S. coming in, and before the tank was invented, they were winning. Well, that depends on how you look at it. But once the tank came in, the machine guns were really effective. No, but artillery was still very effective against the early tanks. And the tank didn't play much of a role, really, until September of 18. Uh, and the early tanks were so slow. Yes, there was... There was panic in the German ranks when those were first introduced in 16, because your rifle, you know, your bullets are bouncing off, the machine gun bullets are bouncing off, but the German artillery gunners figured out pretty quickly, these things are only going three to four miles an hour, we can target them with our guns, and they could not withstand heavy artillery shells. But... The Germans had some heavier guns, but the Allies, the Entente, were able to produce far more shells than the, British, than, than the Germans could. So the Germans had bigger caliber weapons, but in terms of quantity, the Entente has the advantage basically all the way through the war. A really critical factor, which goes beyond the scope of this talk, but really factors into the overall 
reason why the Germans lost is the United States. Even without coming into the war, we provided vast quantities of munitions and money to the Entente. We would have done the same thing for the Germans. We'd have happily done that, but the British wouldn't let us. So lots of American investment flows into Britain, flows into France, lots of American weaponry, and the British and French have the luxury of tapping into that market when they need extra food or extra weapons, and the central powers don't. They have to make do completely with what they have internally. And over the course of the four years of the war, they run down. They, they run out of livestock, they run out of men. By 1916, they don't have enough men to mine the coal that they need to run the factories to create the shells, and at the same time still have enough men in the front. So they're, they're engaged in this dance where they're trying to pull guys off the front lines and send them to the factories for a few months to get some coal and then hustle them quickly back out to the front lines. You don't have, you don't have the livestock you need, so agricultural production goes way down because the oxen and horses are being drafted and sent out to the front lines. You don't have farming machinery in large quantities, so you're reduced to human power. You can't produce enough food. So the population gets weaker, disease becomes more common, and all of these problems stem from this defeat, from this failure. Yeah. So I want to follow up with Chris, uh, mm -hmm. the point that you were making. So you said you know, that one of the ways the Germans maybe could you know, win the war would be to just outlast the Allies, basically make it so bloody and so painful and drag out so long down and just say, enough. Right. And, you know, was there ever really a time in the war, you know, maybe when after the Russians drop out with the Russian Revolution, where that was a, a real possibility that the allies would say, you know what, we're good. We're just, this is, we can't do this anymore, and we're going to come up with some sort of, you know, non-Versailles-like, you know, peace. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to say. I you know, um, I, I'm inclined to think yes if the Germans had not launched the unrestricted submarine campaign. The, the chronology of the, of the decisions that are, that are made is such that they, they opt for unrestricted war in January of 17. And the, Rus the first Russian Revolution happens in March. Now, if they don't make that decision, and the Russians have the revolution, and then especially the second one in October, and they drop out, and France has its... The French army mutinies in April of 17. If the U.S. isn't there coming in with all those troops because there's been no submarine campaign and Russia quits, you, know, you have to kind of wonder if the French, at least, who'd suffered enormously, would not have said at some point, you know, let's try and cut a reasonable deal, if the Germans would have agreed to it. But the, the problem with that whole line of thinking is that the Germans were so set on what they called a Germanic peace that they weren't willing to consider anything less. It was going to be for them, we're going to come out of this dominating Europe or we're going to lose completely. So they lose completely. Um, yeah. Uh, after French, uh, and we got Hague. Uh, yes. There's some revisionists that say that now that Hague is, you know, you know, he was almost pressing because he, he looked at the numbers mm -hmm. and he was uh, he considered Grant a, a great general. <laughs> so was Hague because he yeah. said, you know what, that's going to that's a straight line after they fall back. Yeah. Uh, and we're just going to trick them, mm -hmm. and they're going to lose. Yeah. And, and there's an argument to be made there. Um, I think you're right, it is kind of a revisionist argument that's come out. Um, certainly what Haig was initially trying to do at the Somme was, as you say, smash his way through, um, and when that doesn't happen, then it becomes, well, we're trying to attrit them, which they absolutely do. And as awful as the Somme was for the British, and it's this catastrophic event. You guys will come across it when we get to some of the literature, and the searing impact it has on, on Great Britain, it's a British victory. It is a British and Entente victory. The German army is broken. 
at the Somme. It is never the same again. Um, they do attrit them, but that's not the kind of victory that they were looking for, and therefore it's, it's viewed still today. The Somme is viewed as a defeat. Um, but you look at the German side of it, and there's some, several books that have come out um, with German diaries and so on that have been published from soldiers at the Somme, and it is clear that these guys, their morale was broken. And, and a lot of these men who fought at the Somme wanted nothing more to do with this war. And that was because of the, the overwhelming preponderance of firepower that the Entente had by that point, that Great Britain in particular had. They fired an artillery barrage to start the Battle of the Somme in 1916 that lasted for a week, 24 hours a day, seven days straight, around the clock. Germans couldn't match that in their wildest dreams. When they fired their heaviest barrage of the war six months earlier at Verdun, it lasted for six hours on one day. There's no way they could even come close to matching the industrial output that Britain was, was cranking out and getting from the United States. Yes, sir. So when you were first describing the canniness of the French commander, what was yeah. his name? Joffre. and a great advantage. I thought this is going to be the story of a great French-British victory, this four or five day battle. But then you, when you started describing the, the German response, it, it sounded more like this is not a story of a French and British victory, it's a story of the German defeat. It's a story of a German loss. So I guess I'm asking which way would you characterize it? Well, I'd say it's both. I know that's a cop out of an answer, <laughs> but but I would say I, I, I would say it is both. Um, let's play the hypothetical and say that Cluck, instead of pulling his troops north, keeps them here and closes the gap. Does anything really significantly change? I think the Germans get pushed back anyway because they're exhausted. They're, they are 500 kilometers, they, they have marched, roughly 500 kilometers. And their troops, their soldiers are simply worn out. And you've got these fresh French troops coming into the battle, not only here around Paris, but also down here. And that, that pressure of those fresh troops is eventually going to tell. The French also... Let's say the Germans close the gap and they hold their position. The French are going to be able to get more men to the lines more quickly. The Germans, they're going to bring, have to bring guys all the way across decimated Belgium. So I think to a degree, Cluck was right in thinking that he has to beat the French Sixth Army and open the road to Paris, or they lose. And failing to do that means defeat. So what's the difference if we retreat or not? We have to win it here, we have to win it now. And Hench and Molka's decision to have them retreat, while smart because it saves the first army, is also recognizing what is now more likely inevitable. This is going to be a really long war. We can't win it. Um, they went to war out here in the West with basically even numbers. And that's not a good way to try to win. If you imagine going back to whatever day, September 3rd or so, and, and imagining the first and second German armies were really smart and really cooperative, mm -hmm. what would have happened? Because you don't have you don't have the first army pushing directly at Paris at that point that maybe could have made a key victory had they kept on. You would have had them a little bit closer together, a little bit further west, and how would that have been better than what happened? I mean, I understand the retreat was an issue, but... Mm -hmm. um, also a good question. It might not have been much better, because what might have happened is you, you have your armies here, and you're pushing this direction. Well, what do you leave in your back, in your back area now? You've got Paris behind you. Um, the initial plan to basically surround Paris 
you know, maybe that would have worked, but they didn't have the men to do it. So once you start, once they ran low on manpower and they had to shorten the line and come in this way, they're always going to have to deal with the major armed encampment of Paris. In some way, shape, or form, they have to deal with that. They either have to detach troops like they did with Antwerp, or Cluck has to face Paris, or something has to be done. And there just aren't the bodies. And that's the, the fundamental problem here, is just the, the manpower shortage. Mm-hmm. Moltke not really understanding and committing to this right hook as much as he could have by keeping troops on, on the left and also by sort of the panic in, you know, the unnecessary panic before Tannenberg yeah. that caused him to detach troops from, like you said, I mean, this is where you win the war or lose the war. So anything you take away from that is a mistake. Yeah. That was the, the, the argument made by all the German commanders in the 1920s. That it, and it's in the German official history. Uh, this is the, the official party line, is that Moltke blew it. That this plan was the perfect plan and it would have won the war, but Moltke sent too many troops here and too many troops east. And for 30 years after the end of this war, that was the, 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 the standard party line. There's a new book that's just come out that echoes that. Um, I'm inclined to say that it's far from a perfect plan. It's, in fact, I refer to it as one of those reckless gambles in, in the title of the book. And it's, we don't have any idea how to win, but we have to win somehow, so this will do it. But you, it comes back to the numbers again. You don't have the manpower. You don't have, you need at least two to one in numbers here. And you don't have it. And you can't have it. It's not possible. Um, unless you send every German soldier and completely ignore every other front. And that's just not feasible. So I'm inclined to say that it's, it's a desperate gamble to see if they can break the morale of the French. And if the French morale doesn't break, they're not going to succeed here. Even if they have those additional men, is it enough? Who knows? Did your numbers for the central powers include the Ottoman Empire? Not at this point, no. They're not in the war. No. Um, it's just Austria, Hungary, and Germany. So those were nothing but Germans and France? And yes. No, yeah. Austrians. no Austrians at all. There were supposed to be some Italians, um, and that... They, they were written into the plan that the Italians were going to take part of the southern front, and that would have freed more German troops. But Italy declares neutrality. They were allied to Germany and Austria-Hungary, but they chose not to get involved until later in the war, and they joined the other side at that point. So, yes? When you look at the lessons learned, mm -hmm. do you think Adolf Hitler learned something from this? Well, I don't know if Hitler did, but, but Manstein who planned the offensive of 1940, certainly did. Um, and you know, the, even this plan, with motorized troops, maybe it works. That was a big difference, though. Yeah. Yep. Um, but having to march, you know, these are guys who are marching 500 kilometers with full packs. They're carrying all of their spare ammunition with them because the railroads... They're all the way back in Germany, and everything's being pulled by horse and cart, so you've got to be able to fight at a moment's notice. These guys are carrying 60 to 70 pound packs for 500 kilometers, day after day after day they're marching and trying to fight battles at the same time. That's, that's going to wear you up. It's going to wear you down. Elijah? I was just wondering, out of curiosity, is Hitler uh, taking part in this yet? Not yet. He volunteers very early in the war, but while this is going on in September, he and many, many other of the volunteers are just going through training. He sees his first action in November as the German army is trying to get around the edge in what's called the race to the sea. Um, battle around the, 
the Belgian city of Ypres, way up, way up at the top, or as the British called it, Wipers. Yeah, um, Y-P-R-E-S. Um, that's where he sees his first action. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, how big is that? How many kilometers? I can't see the scale. I can't read the numbers. How wide is the actual gap? It was about 20 kilometers. And nobody noticed it? Well, they noticed it. But as I say, the British were really worried that this was a trap. You know, the Germans are trying to lure us in here, and then they're going to they're going to cut us off and destroy us. And Cluck certainly knew about it. He just didn't care you know, because one, he wants to be the guy who takes Paris. Two, he realizes he's got to destroy the French Sixth Army. Bulow doesn't have the manpower to do anything about it. Yeah, yeah. It is a big, big hole in the line, yes. And the Allies exploit it, and they, they get a critical victory. Yep. It looks to me, if, if Germany had played the one hit war game, and they had really been honest with themselves, logistics is what killed them. Mm -hmm. Man for man, they might have won out, but the logistics definitely killed them. They gamed this plan endlessly. They gamed it again and again and again. They had field maneuvers. They did, they did board games of it. They did maneuvers in the field from 1905 to 1914. And the basic issue was they could not conceive of any other means. So it had to be this. Eventually it was, this is the only chance we're going to have. We have to do it. Um, before they become, yep, yep. It doesn't help, though, that when they did a lot of the war gaming, the Kaiser took part. And the Kaiser's side always had to win. Regardless of anything else that's happening on the battlefield or in the game, the Kaiser's side always had to win. So that skews your study a little bit. <laughs> That won't happen, yeah, right, yes. Let's just start to that. That's not, that's not right. Yeah, that is true, yeah. Other questions? So, um, well, I guess I'm basically done. <laughs> um, the major consequence here is, as I've said, that this is, this is the only realistic chance for the German army to win this war. The, uh, the Navy comes close, actually, with the submarines. And that's a whole other story, and that'll probably be three years from now when I give a talk on that. Um, but for the German Army, this is their opportunity. Now, they look at the war later on, and they do think of themselves as winning. And you look at a map, and you can see the Germans, they're deep in Russia, they're in France, they're in Belgium, and it looks like they're winning. What started me on this whole project was a student question. I was teaching this in a 20th century course, and I have a program, which I can't get to run on this computer, um, which shows the borders expand and then contract. And you have the borders of late 1918. The Germans are way out here. They're, they're deep in Russia. They're in France. The very next screenshot is November 1918. Boom. Everything's down to Germany. And I had this one student who asked, well, how the heck did that happen? So I tried to explain it. And then I went looking for a book that could explain it for him, and there wasn't one. So I figured, well, I guess I better write it. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, the German people, by the way, are never told about this defeat. This was, they're, they're getting newspaper report after newspaper report. This war is almost over. We are on the brink of victory. All they learn about the Marne is that we have had to reposition our forces to better strike at the French. Nobody learns about this devastating defeat until the war is over. And the German generals go to the drawing board to try to explain it to themselves in the general history. That's when the German people find out that they had lost this decisive battle basically a month into the war. And that's common all the way through. All the bad news is strictly censored. The German people don't learn about any of the defeats. They get only the good news, 
which is why they are so, so shocked and surprised when suddenly it's November 1918 and they're signing an armistice that means they lost, which is fertile ground for people coming along later and saying, we got stabbed in the back, we were betrayed. So that censorship plays a big role in helping out people like Hitler down the road. Other questions? Yes. Um, no, um, and some German women did help, but what was going on there was a general societal attitude, which was simply that, you know, women don't do that. And in Britain, you know, women did. They, they were pulled out and they went off and they worked in munitions plants, and the Germans all the way through did not want their women doing that. So some did, but for the most part, they really, that was really frowned on, and they were not going to make use of, of female labor to any large extent. They don't even do it in World War II. They're, they're in the Second World War and desperately in need of manpower, and they don't want women going into factories. Well, not German women. <laughs> okay. yeah. yeah, I'll just let that go. Um, <laughs> there are probably German women in this room. Well, I'm so. just saying, they were planning on having a lot other women. Oh, yes, yeah. I'm sorry, I thought you were just making a joke. Yeah. Oh, sure. Jewish women, Belgian women, yep, French women, absolutely. Right. They need to be at home cranking out Aryan babies. Yeah. The Germans did try to use Belgians in World War I to supplement their manpower shortage, but that didn't work very well either um, for all kinds of reasons. The Belgians obviously don't want to work, and... The Germans were, were fortunately reluctant in this war to do the things they did in the second to make these people work. So um, that's no real great boost to their manpower shortage. Other questions? All right. Yeah. Could I just ask you about the uh, going all the way back to the alliances? Mm -hmm. It was absolutely, as Matt just said, absolutely unnatural. It was a com centuries of animosity between yes. Britain and France, and yet they're tight here, and I don't quite understand why. Okay. Well, that's where Windsor comes from. Right. They, they, they were, the, they, they were Saxe Coburgs yeah. uh, until the war broke out, and then they had to become the Windsors. And the, the initial head of the British Navy, Louis Battenberg, could, he had to change his name, so he became Louis Mountbatten. Um, but yeah, the, the, what, what happened, well, the short answer is that the Germans decided, the Kaiser decided, he needed to have a big battle fleet. And he began, he and, he and Alfred von Tirpitz began building a gigantic German battle fleet in 1900 that was aimed very clearly at Great Britain. So you've got the British, whose entire empire is dependent on naval power, and you've got the leading military power in Europe building the second biggest battle fleet in Europe, clearly aimed at you, and the Germans did this partly because they figured there's no way that Britain is ever going to make a deal with France. So we'll be able to get them on their own, and we can probably defeat them. And, and the British, for purely practical reasons, decided in 1904 and 5, we need to bury the hatchet with the French. There is a bigger problem here, and that's Germany. So they signed the Entente Cordiale, which was this shocking agreement that, you know, we're going to bury our old colonial differences, and we're going to support France. It's not an alliance. As I said earlier, Gray can always say, no, 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 we don't have to go help the French. Um, but they made that decision mainly because of the German fleet and the, the, the growing belligerence of Germany. So it was fear. Fear of Germany forcing Britain and France together. But it's not 
by any means a rosy marriage. All the way through the war, there are all kinds of disputes. And it is only in 1918 when finally, under the pressure of German attacks that year, that they kind of bury the hatchet and the French take full command. It is, it's a rocky marriage all the way through. And the French, for understandable reasons, all the way through the war, want France to be the main focus of the fighting. The Germans are left in large occupation of large parts of France. We want a big British army here to help us kick them out. And the British are thinking, well, you know, we're at war with the Ottoman Empire. Maybe we should go to the Middle East and yeah, occupy some territory out there. Or let's send some troops to Italy to go fight the Austrians because they don't have as good an army. So the British are kind of looking at other areas, and that adds to the friction. It's a great question, though. Um, I should ask it on an exam. <laughs> yeah, the, you said the, the short version is a really good long story about all the kinds of pieces of it. Oh, there is, yeah. 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 Yes, Dave. Um, so this whole thing starts with uh, the Austrians and the Hungary, right? Yep. Uh, and the Serbians. Yep. Uh, well, what happens to them? <laughs> <laughs> They, they very quickly get lost in the shuffle. It literally. Um, it starts with, with Austria declaring war on Serbia, and within three days Germany is declaring war on Russia and on France, and then Britain is declaring war on Germany. They don't get around to declaring war on Austria until like August 15th. And they fight their own little war, which the Serbians initially win. Um, eventually the Germans send troops down to help destroy the Serbian army, and Serbia does get overrun. But the war starts because of the assassination, and then very quickly that whole thing becomes a backwater. And it's, it's clear that what this war is really about is not Franz Ferdinand. I mean, even the Austrian government didn't really care about Franz Ferdinand. And I was telling these guys the story today. The, the, the emperor, Franz Joseph, he wouldn't even let Franz Ferdinand be buried in the family vault because he, he disliked him so much because he married a woman who was not sufficiently high class. So no head of state goes to Franz Ferdinand's funeral. You know, nobody really cares about him. It's about power politics. And very, very quickly it's clear this is all about Germany and German power, and are we going to let Germany dominate Europe or are we not? And everything going on in the Balkans kind of gets pushed to the back burner. Great question. Other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for coming. And for those, thank you. For those of you who are new to the series, we do them once a month, first Tuesday of each month, and every one is different. Bob will be giving one in November. Um, and hopefully Carl Byron will be giving one in December, though I'm not so sure about that. And we have one in October. I forget who that is. Is that you, Dave, in October? Or are you in spring? Oh, it's Rich. Rich Edwards in, in October. So, yep. so are you planning on what are you going to do one of these every year to kind of cover a different, since we're in the 100th anniversary, if we're going to roll through, you could do a lecture on the song or a lecture on the I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> there are a lot of people here who want to give talks. So, <laughs> I had the advantage because I've organ I organized this whole thing that I could say, you know, I'm taking this spot. <laughs> Because it's 100 years to the day of the end of that battle, so I'm taking the spot. But, all right. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you.